Okay, so we are looking at uh, memory. So in the previous lecture, we have reviewed prefetching, which is trying to reduce the misrate. <coughs> so to improve memory system performance, you have to uh, think about average memory access time. What is the average memory access time equation, AMAT? That's right. So you have to think about cache and memory. So to access the memory system, you have to look up the cache. So you have to determine hit or miss, which takes hit time, right? Cache access time. And then if you miss, you need to pay additional penalty, right? So hit time plus miss rate times miss penalty, right? Hit time plus miss rate times miss penalty. So to reduce Average memory access time, you have to reduce hit time, you have to reduce miss rate, you have to reduce miss penalty. Then all three components will be reduced, then you can decrease your average memory access time, and then you can improve the system performance. Okay? Uh, so prefetching is trying to reduce the miss rate, especially it's trying to reduce the compulsory miss, which is inevitable or inavoidable unavoidable message that you pay initially uh, for the cash access because cash is empty. Even if you have infinite cash, if you access some memory block for the first time, it will miss the cash. So it will cause compulsory message. Okay? What is this uh, instruction streaming buffer? What, what's the <coughs> idea of this instruction streaming buffer? Chayan, what is the idea of ISP? Minji, what is the idea of ISP? Okay, so when you try to access cache, okay, by a load operation, uh, usually you fetch a single memory, on a cache means you fetch a single memory block from the memory into the cache. But with ISB, you actually fetch two consecutive cache blocks on a cache means. And the first block that actually you missed goes into the instruction cache, but the second block it's going into the ISP, okay? So it's actually fetching two blocks instead of single block. So even if you miss the instruction cache, uh, the data or uh, the instruction you're looking for might be in the ISP because you fetched another block, right? So by fetching two consecutive blocks, you can avoid some uh, compulsory message. Compulsory message, right? This is called ISP and as, you have, as we have reviewed, it has a substantial impact on the system performance. Uh, this is for spec 2000, and this is actual performance improvement. If you look at this floating point or server benchmark with ISB, it can improve more than 20% performance for most of the benchmark. Okay? And for integer, the performance advantage is, is a little bit lower, but you still get substantial performance for the two application. For the other application, the actual performance is less than 15%. Okay? But still, with small ISB buffer, you can improve uh, instruction fetch performance, and it can actually improve the sh total system performance. It's substantial. It's not just front end, right? It's entire system performance will be improved substantially by 
having this additional buffer called ISB. Okay? The same streaming buffer technique can be used for data cache as well. Okay? And ISB is common for high performance processors and data streaming buffer are starting to be used in uh, recent microprocessors to improve data cache performance as well. Okay? For data cache performance, you can use same technique, streaming buffer. You can fetch two cache blocks instead of single cache block, or you can use some software prefetching, which inserts some software prefetch instruction, which prefetch some future cache block that you think you will miss from memory into the cache. So this is different from load operation. Load is from memory to a register. This prefetch is from memory to a cache, first level cache, which is different. Okay? And it's called software prefetching, and it's usually effective for uh, stride-based memory access, which means if you do a loop, based uh, memory access, you usually access a range in sequentially, and then it generates stride. What is stride? Minji, what is stride? Changyan, what is stride? Tujin, what is stride? I guess uh, it means uh, locality. Uh, it's not locality. Stride means the difference between two different, uh, two consecutive uh, reference. So if you access memory location 1000, the next uh, uh, reference 1004, 1008, 1012, then the stride becomes 4. Normally, in 32-bit processor, if you access integer array sequentially, then it will generate a stride of 4. If you access A0, maybe A10, and so on, the stride might be 40. Right? And that's stride. So you can actually, uh, from the compiler analysis, you can find this stride by analyzing your loop and array, and you can insert this prefetch instruction ahead of iteration so that when you actually use the data, the prefetch instruction already preloaded the data into the cache. So if you load, it will cache, code cache hit. Okay? <coughs> That's uh, stride weight prefetching, which is usually often used for data reference. Okay? <coughs> Okay, so you can reduce some compulsory message by employing prefetching. So we have reviewed instruction prefetching and data prefetching. And how about capacity miss? The only way is you just need to increase your cache size. Okay? What's the... So, <coughs> first level cache. You have maybe 8 kilobyte first level cache. Okay? There are too many comp compulsory message. Uh, too many capacity message because cache is small. So they decided to increase the cache size to maybe 32 kilobytes instead of 8 kilobytes. What is the issue? Why can why can you cannot why you cannot increment uh, incre increase the size of this cache? Penalty time. Hit time. And penalty time. Why it increase the penalty? To it. Uh, so you have first level cache and memory. You just increase your first level cache size. Does it increase your miss penalty? Yes. Why? Why did you miss penalty? Yeah. 
it is time to leave cash. What? Can you say that again? What is miss penalty? It is time to leave cash up. No. So you just increase the hit time. Miss penalty means on a miss, you access memory. For memory, you don't change anything. The path to the memory and memory system is the same. So miss penalty should be the same. Understood? I don't know, actually, you guys understand or not. Because you always say understand, but I'm not sure. Minji, understand? It didn't change anything to the pass to the memory or memory system itself. So miss penalty is the same. You miss, then you pay the penalty, same penalty. But the hit time is increased. Why? Minji, I'm asking you again. Why do you have to increase your hit time? Huh? More comparators? I say, I'll say this is a direct map cache. You increase from 8 kilobyte direct map cache to 32 kilobyte direct map cache. Did you increase number of comparators? Do you have to increase number of comparators? Changyan, do you have to increase number of comparators? The same direct map cache, you just increase the cache size. Why do they increase the hit time? That's my, that, that was my question. Why we have to increase the hit time? So I'm asking you again, so why do you have to increase the hit time? Because we have to search more content. Search more content, let's say this is direct map, ca direct map cache. Hit time consists of which component? Can you explain the procedure of accessing the direct map cache? Minji, can you explain direct map cache organization? What happened on a, to determine hit or miss, what happened? Okay, so for cache, direct map cache access, what do you do? You get your virtual address, a uh, physical address. Physical address is generated from the TLB after the translation. From the physical address, address is decomposed into tag, index, and offset. For the direct map cache, there is only one location, one entry you, have, you need to look up, look up. Because direct map cache, you limit the number of block to only a single block in the cache. That is the only place your memory block can go to for direct map cache. So <coughs> from the index, after the index decoding, you identify this block. It's the only location you need to look up. And then for that cache block, there is a tag. Tag is the identification of that ca <coughs> cache block, high order bits of the memory address. You need to compare the tag from the physical address and the tag in the cache lab if they are matching comparison. And then it means you have a cache hit. So the cache access consists of decoding time plus tag comparison, compare, compare time. Okay, if the cache becomes larger and larger, decoding time takes a little bit longer because decoding is the end gauge. Right? You have more input to the end gate, which means it takes a little longer. Okay, it increases the decoding time. And also the wires, because cache is a two-dimensional array. So you have this decoding line coming into the bit line, <coughs> coming into the selection line, and the bit line is also longer. So it takes longer because of the wire delay and more delay decoding time. But the comparator is nothing to do with cache access. Even if you have fully associative cache, the compar comparison time, comparisons are done in parallel, which means you just pay one compa compare time. Right? Even for set associative cache or fully associative cache. So even if you have many comparators, it doesn't increase any cache access time. Okay? So the cache size affects decoding time and the wire delay. Okay, so <coughs> you want to reduce the miss rate, so you want to reduce compulsory miss. You can employ prefetching. You want to reduce 
uh, capacity miss, maybe you want to have larger caches, but it increases the cache access time, hit time. If you increase cache access time, cache access might take two cycle or three cycle or four cycle instead of single cycle. If the cache access takes four cycle, it means you have frequent pipeline store because of read after, if you have back to back load followed by user instruction that used the data loaded by the previous load instruction, then the user instruction has to wait until the load complete. Right? If it takes two cycles, it generates one cycle store. If the load operation takes four cycles, it generates three cycle storage, which will decrease your system performance. Okay? That's, that is the reason why you cannot use bigger cache. Right? Bigger cache is expensive, and it might reduce your total system performance. Okay, reducing compulsory message. So if you have a direct mapped cache, you can <coughs> reduce this conflict message by increasing associativity, which means you can employ said associative cache. For compared to direct mapped cache, by having said associative cache, you can reduce conflict message substantially, right? If you have four-way set of shape tip cache, you can reduce further. For large caches, such as two megabyte cache, uh, direct, mesh cache direct mapped cache might be enough. But if you have two-way set of shape tip cache, then the performance of two-way set of shape tip cache is about the same as maybe fully associative cache. So I don't have the miss rate figure, but if you look at the miss rate figure of the three compulsory capacity conflict misses, that is in your undergraduate computer architecture uh, <coughs> textbook, then this comp conflict message are substantial for small caches, but it is quite reduced for large caches. And for big caches, it's not that significant. Okay? <coughs> so we studied victim cache before. When, when you study trace cache, what is the victim? Mm -hmm. When conflict miss occurred, before the earlier instruction, excuse me. The earlier instruction changes the instruction. Not the instruction. It's nothing to do with the instruction. Changes the cache block. Replaced cache block, not changed. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so, uh, a victim is a cash block that it, uh, which is on a cash miss. Sometimes you have to replace the old block with a new block because you have a miss. There is a new incoming block that is going to the cash. You have to find the victim that is going to be replaced. This is called victim block, victim cash block, okay? Block, cash block. So you have to think about English also, right? Change, replace, you, have, you should not confuse, okay? So victim cash block means whenever you have a cash, means usually, usually the victim block, you just throw it away, okay? For write back cash, if it's dirty block, you just write back to the memory the next level, but you just throw it away, okay? But if you have a victim cache, for, for a cache, you have a separate, small, fully associative cache. Maybe it's about eight entries, small cache, but it's fully associative. Fully associative cache means it's fast, and it has high heat rate, with that cache size, okay? Instead of throwing away, you insert this victim block into the victim cache, okay? For direct mapped cache, there are too many conflict messages because if you are not lucky, your all the memory block that you are accessing are mapping to the same cache block that will cause lots of victims. Okay? But if you put that victim in a victim cache block, victim cache, usually a small number of victims or a small number of cache block in the cache 
code this conflict message. If you stole this victim in the victim cache, then even if you miss, you can find those victims in the victim cache. And that can capture most of your conflict message. Because conflict message, it generates victims, but you have stored it into your victim cache. OK? So if you have two solutions for direct mapped cache, you have direct mapped cache, you have two way set of, let's say four-way set of sheets cache for the first level cache. Four-way set of sheet cache can give you a little bit higher hit rate because they can reduce conflict message. OK? But it actually increases your hit time because you need decoding, compare, and then Waymox because you have to select multiple Waybank. You have multiple blocks from each bank. And you have to select which one based on this confusion result. Right? It increases your hit time, access time. So maybe if you implement in uh, <coughs> set of shape cache, instead of single cycle cache, it might become two cycle access. Right? The solution is you can have a victim cache, similar victim cache. So whenever you have a miss, you just store it the victim cache. But when you access your cache, you have to access instruction cache or data cache in parallel with victim cache in parallel. And even if you miss, you might find the same block from the victim cache. So you can hit the victim. And it can improve your uh, cache hit rate substantially using this small fully associated cache. This is called victim cache. OK? OK, so there is another factor you need to consider when you design your cache, which is what should be the size of this cache block? OK, usually small cache has small cache block, large cache has larger cache block. Memory page is a block, which is much bigger than cache block. Cache block size is usually as small as maybe 32 bytes, as big as maybe 1024 bytes. It depends on the cache size. Okay? <clears throat> if you increase your cache block, then you can decrease compulsory message because long cache block or big cache block means you have some implicit prefetching effect because you're just not only fetching a single data item, you fetch consecutive other locations. Okay, by having a larger cash block. Okay? But you increase your miss penalty because when on a miss, instead of bringing a single data item, you need to bring a multiple data items, which you should pay a little bit more penalty. Right? Even though the latency, which is the delay, is the same. If you increase block, <coughs> block size, then you have to pay additional transport time by transmitting these blocks from memory to the cache. Okay? But if you increase block size for maybe direct map cache or set associative cache, you have less number of blocks in your cache, which will increase conflict message. Okay? So essentially, it's too, if, if it's too small, maybe too many compulsory message, right? But if it's too big, then it will generate too many conflict misses and so on. So miss penalty is if the block size is big, this is access time means latency. Right? Latency is the delay. You request your cache miss request to the memory. And some time later, memory system will send you the first byte, which is the latency. OK? Delay. Minji, do you know what I'm saying? It takes time for the cache miss. Cache request your memory system. To go to the memory, you go to the front side bus, chipset, memory bus, and theme card, system bus, and so on. It takes time. And the first byte arrives. That is the delay. OK? And then, based on this bus bandwidth, if the bus can transmit, if it's 64 bit bus, it can transmit 8 bits per cycle. Right? It's 64, 8 bytes per cycle. And it depends on the cache block size. If it's 32 bytes, then you need four cycles. Right? If it's 256 bytes, it might require 32 clock cycles, bus cycles. Right? So that's basically this transport time. <coughs> so miss rate is decreased because you can decrease compulsory message. But as you increase, it will increase because you, it will increase conflict message. OK? 
Okay? So overall, average memory access time is miss hit rate plus miss rate times miss penalty it will be something like this. And there is a sixth part. Okay? And it depends on the cache size. Okay? So every cache, you need to find out the optimum block size. Okay? Okay, <clears throat> so we have reviewed how to reduce the uh, miss rate. Let's think about the miss penalty, how we can reduce the miss penalty. Miss penalty means on a miss, you ask. And then late, you pay the latency and then transfer time. This is total miss penalty. And then as soon as your complete block arrived, and then and you insert into the cache, and then it's done. So this is total miss penalty. Okay? So how can we reduce this miss penalty? <coughs> this is just simple optimization, this intuitive. If you access cache, if you miss, you access memory. Then you always pay cache access time. And then you have miss penalty. If you want to reduce miss penalty, what you can do is you can access cache at the same time you access memory in parallel. Right? Then you can reduce this hit time portion from your miss penalty. This is what it means. Start cache and memory access in parallel. And early start and critical world first in <coughs> sorry. So if you think about this procedure on a miss, you pay the latency, and, and then after some time, the first byte arrives, second byte arrives, maybe total 256 byte arrives, and you insert into the cache, and then you, f you access the cache again, you get the request data item from the cache block, and send it to the pipeline. Right? That's the normal procedure. You pay miss penalty, you fill into your cache, this is called fill, because you are filling the cache. And then you re-catch the <coughs> block, and then you have to extract the, the data item, because 256 bytes, you normally access only 32 bit or 64 bit data or instruction. So you have to extract the data and send it to the pipeline. And you don't have to do that, right? You don't have to wait until you fill the buffer, fill the cache. As soon as the data arrived, the data item you are looking for arrived, then you grab the data or grab the instruction and you send it to the pipeline immediately, even before you fill the cache. That's what it means, okay? Early start and critical world first. As soon as the requested world, which can be instructional data, arrived from the memory, you pass to the CPU, which means pass to the pipeline, to the instruction pipeline, or to the uh, fetch stage or the execution, execution stage, okay? And finish the line fill later. Okay. Understood? Okay, how to reduce, this is reducing read miss penalty. How about on a write miss? On a write miss. <coughs> if you Doing a store operation into your cache, if you miss, this is called write miss, you have to write to the next level, memory. Right? It takes a lot of time. You have to pay miss penalty. It might take 500 cycles. Okay? Because memory access is, takes very, very long compared to CPU cycle time. CPU is running at more than 3 gigahertz. Right? Memory is, uh, in terms of CPU cycle, maybe 500 cycles or 1,000 cycles. Okay? So what you can do is you can insert a write buffer between cache and memory. This is called write buffer. On a write miss, you do not wait until the write completes in the memory system. You just write into the write buffer. And then it's done. And it returns. And the processor can continue. And the write buffer will do the write for you uh, as a background process. OK? <coughs> So for a write miss, you store the data into a buffer, write buffer, and the CPU does not have to wait on a write miss. You just write into the write buffer and that's it. And write buffer will do the remaining job. Okay? It can decrease the write stores. Okay? And 
right buffer because there can be multiple writes, right? And the write has not been completed, then the write buffer should have multiple end feeds. Okay? And uh, it should be a coalescing write buffer, which means sometimes you do a write to the same cache block again and again. Okay? And then, you know, miss, you, there might be already in the same block might be already remain in the write buffer. You have to update the write buffer again and again. Okay, if you have two entries, that should be combined into a single entry. If it's same address. Okay, that is called coalescing write buffer. So write buffer is actually a small cache. There is a tag. You have to identify whether this miss is already performed before. And if it has the same entry, write buffer has the same entry, you can write into the write buffer. Okay? That is called coalescing write buffer. So they can merge redundant write. And it's called associative write buffer because if you miss your cache, sometimes on a read miss, the data might be in the write buffer. Okay? Because you have not completed. It might be still stay in the write buffer. So you have to look up the write buffer also. Okay? So write buffer should be a cache and there should be a tag. If you tag a tag, it, they call it associative. And associative means you, can, you need to search. Okay? So associative write buffer on a read miss, read, on a read. And this is critical for write through cache. Write through cache means every time you write to the cache, you have to write write through to the memory. Right? It generates too many writes. Write back cache means you just do a write on your first level cache. Write back cache means on, when this block is replaced, you write to the memory. That's write back cache. Right? Both cases, we need the write buffer. Write through cache is simpler to design, simpler to maintain cache coherence issues. It was used in early microprocessors. But nowadays, all, most of high performance processors use write back cache because they can reduce this write traffic, which can improve the system performance. Write back cache is more high performance cache. Okay? So even if you have write back cache, you need this write buffer because on a write miss, it on a replacement, it generates a write, and you don't have, you don't want to wait. You just write into the write buffer, and write buffer will do the remaining process. Okay. <coughs> so <coughs> let's say for now, let's say we have a data cache. This is a direct mapped cache. You sometimes insert a victim cache, okay, to reduce compass, the conflict message, okay. You also put write buffer for this data cache because on a write miss, you don't want to wait until write is performed to the memory. You just want to write into the write buffer. Okay? You also need fill buffer because on a miss, the block is coming from memory. Sometimes there is a read or write going on. You don't want to disturb this process. So the block from the memory should be stored into the fill buffer first. And then whenever this cache is idle, then fill buffer needs to fill the cache. So you have <coughs> cache, victim cache, write buffer, fill buffer. Okay? And or sometimes streaming buffer also. Right? So cache is not just a single cache. To access the cache, there is a streaming buffer, write buffer, victim cache, fill buffer. And we have not studied store buffer. You can have store buffer. So multiple small cache structures are organized as a single cache uh, complex to serve the first level cache to improve the performance. Okay? And these are small caches around this cache. Okay? And there might be other buffers such as ordering buffer, which we need for memory ordering which we will study because it's a complex issue for a multiprocessor. Mm. Okay? So cache becomes more complex and complex. So when I work for Itanium processor, as I said, we have 600 designers. We have three teams, memory, core pipeline, and i 32 engine, which translate I32 instruction into exit, uh, I64, which is a risk instruction, because I32 is a CISC, right? 
And so there's a hardware translation in which it's small part, maybe 15% or 10% of the total chip area, and that much engineers. Core team is for uh, this pipeline, pipeline control execution unit, floating point unit, integer memory, and so uh, not memory, but memory is just a cache. But memory, as I said, it has field buffer, victim cache, <coughs> store buffer, write buffer, maybe streaming buffer, maybe prefetching mechanism, and so on. It's become quite complex. So. When we actually design, we have this RTL, which is logic model of the processor design. And we do the simulation. We, we are learning application on this RTL, logic model, and prove whether this uh, design actually produced the correct program. Okay? But always, this memory team is lagging behind. They are slow, because it's too complex. These are not complex. At the more complex part is coherence which is okay. The more complex mechanism is memory ordering issues, which is quite complex. And so <clears throat> the chip was delayed because of the memory. <laughs> they are always slow. Okay? So memory is not simple. So if you think about just fully associative cache, direct mapped cache, or set associative cache, it's very simple design, right? It's table, basically. But once you try to improve performance, it becomes more and more complex. Because to the memory, to the cache, you need to apply pipelining also, pipeline the cache, and non-blocking cache, multiple to design, and with lots of these small buffers, with cache coherence uh, transaction going on. So there are multiple transactions. Think about uh, four issue i7. Uh, processor core, right? Intel processor. It's four issue. Four issue means there are four instructions are processed every cycle. So it can be four uh, memory operations. So there should be, in my uh, guess, there should be at least two memory ports to the cache. Two memory ports means every cycle, it should allow two memory operations because usually maybe one or two should be a memory operation out of the four uh, instructions that are processed simultaneously. So memory, the cache should have two ports. Two ports means you can issue two load operations to the memory. Okay, so there are two loads going on. One can be a read, load. The other can be a store. Okay, and there might be miss, there it allows, it should be non-blocking cache means there should be multiple missed going into the memory and coming back. So you have a field going back into the cache, okay? And there is also cache coherence transaction, as I explained. So if some other processor core or other processor chip is doing a write on the same memory location, you have to look at the bus. And if it's the same address, then you have to search your tab. If it match, you have to invalidate the cache block. So there is a coherence, which is an invalidated cache going from bus to your cache. And they are lo looking up your tab. So you have two banks. One is data, the other is tab. Tags are accessed by field, loads, writes, and this invalidate, snoop, request. And data is also accessed from time to time. Okay? And you have processed this in parallel in a pipeline fashion. And if you consider memory ordering, then you have to think about how to order this, otherwise it might produce wrong result. If you allow too much restric, uh, strict ordering, which is called sequential ordering, then memory system is become too slow, and it will slow down your system. So you want to relax this ordering, which is called processor consistency model, or release consistency model, or weak consistency model. Then you have to think about these ordering issues of multiple requests coming back, and you have to make them in some uh, right order. Okay? that will make your cache design quite complex. Okay? So, if you are a, a graduate from United States, right? Let's say you are not in Korea University, you might be in Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, which is a good engineering school. You are a graduate student, and you go to Intel, right? For maybe next generation 
I let's say 10 processor design team and they want you to design this cache and they ask <laughs> they ask you the same question cache size if you answer that way then you will be you know what I mean usually they have this uh, competition so in Itanium processor team, which was called the Merced Project, 600 engineers, every year they evaluate employees. Among the, if based on the evaluation, 20% of engineers are fired from the company. Probation. They go through the probation period. They monitor your performance for three months. If you do not perform well, they are, they are evicted from the company. That's the Intel, okay? So in our design team, we have our 30 microarchitect. Microarchitect team is the most brain of the 600 design team. We have six uh, microarchitect and about 25 microarchitecture validation engineers, okay? At the time, I have six-man team. I, I was the leader in the six-man team. And two engineers are evicted from the company one, one engineer had received a uh, watch <coughs> from CMU, Carnegie Mellon. The other engineer is from U of Michigan. Okay? They got master degree, but they are evicted because they cannot do the job. Let me explain about the lack of free cash. Lack of free cash. Lack of free cash means if you miss the cash, usually the old cash is they lock up. If you miss cash, until the miss is served, the cache cannot process any other request. They are locked. Okay? It's called the lock. <coughs> That's the old cache. Lock of free cache means even you miss, they send the request to the memory. And then they still allow new incoming requests. They can accept new incoming requests. It's called the lock of free cache. So it, it's actually generating multiple outstanding requests to the memory because it can I can send requests again, or even if on a miss, okay? It's called lack of free cache. Lack of free cache. <coughs> it allows multiple outstanding requests. So, it's a little bit different from pipelining. Okay? Even if you don't employ pipelining, let's say cache access takes two cycles. You miss the cache. Lack of cache means on a miss, they cannot do anything until the miss is served. It might take 100 cycles or 1,000 cycles. Okay, so lack of free cache means you can still send requests, right? After maybe, miss the latency is only two seconds. Two seconds, you can send a request. Lack of, free, lack of cache, they cannot process. I'm processing the miss. I cannot handle your request. Lack of free cache means, okay, it's gone. So I can accept new request. That's called lack of free cache. Okay? Pipelining means in addition to lack of free, you pipeline. So every cycle, you can send a new request. It's a different concept, okay? But usually, they combine. So lack of free cash usually means it's pipeline system with out of order data return, which means some data might come from the L2 cache, some miss come from the L3, some might come from the memory. It come out of order, okay? <coughs> and this cache is called, lack of free cash is called non-blocking cache. No, it's not blocking, okay? So lack of free cache is equal to non-blocking cache, which is a little different from pipeline cache, but they usually combine pipeline into the uh, non-blocking cache or lack of free cache. So if they say lack of free cache or non-blocking cache, you can assume that it's also pipeline because most of them are implemented that way. But pipelining is a little bit different concept as I explained, okay? <coughs> so if you look at the processor, uh, in Pentium processor, first level cache uh, took only one cycle. Because at the time, 
the ship fuel cycle time clock speed was not that high, and the cache was small. So cache access can be done in a single cycle for the first level cache. Starting from Pentium 4, right, that's fourth generation x86 processor, and Pentium 3, it took two cycles. The first level cache access two cycles. Starting from Pentium 4 and i7, the first level cache access takes four cycles. So you need to pipeline, otherwise you should pay uh, when it's stored cycles for data or instruction cache access. Okay? Algena? Understood? Stack top? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm asking you stack top. Can you distinguish multiple memory? What is memory port? What is the port? So all this memory system has some port. The register has register port. Memory has memory port. What is port? <clears throat> Guyan, what is port? I don't know what you mean. What is memory port? I don't know where I don't know where but my guess is that it is your transmission line. Transmission line? Any idea? Any idea? What is the like, connection line? Excuse me? What is the connection? Connection line? Terminal. 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 So, so multiple terminal means same location, but it will have multiple terminal like. Multiple terminal will locate same location. I think basically he understands the concept, but uh, <coughs> so port means, let's say, think about the register file, okay? Register file, it, if it has one port, that means every cycle you can access, it allows only single access to a single register. You can read, for example, only single register, every cycle. Do you know what I mean? You can, they allow only one read. That's called one read port. Okay? Uh, if the register file, so for, <coughs> for example, if you think about uh, five stage pipeline we studied, fetch, decode, read, execute, write back. So every cycle, there are five instructions in each pipeline stage. If you think about register file, register files are read by read stage instruction. They are reading two registers, so you need two read ports, okay? And if you think about write back stage, the instruction at write back stage is writing a register into the register file. So they should have one write port. And the other stage, fetch stage, decode stage, or execution stage, they don't touch register file. Register file is accessed only by the read stage and write back stage. So every cycle, the register file should allow two read ports and one write port, which means it can allow two read access and one write access every cycle. Okay? That's port. Understand? So for single issue uh, five-stage pipeline, we have studied the register file should allow two read ports and one write port. Port means access per cycle, okay? Let's assume that we have two issue superscalar, two issue superscalar processor with same five stage pipeline. The register file should allow 
how many ports stacked up? Okay, for single issue, we need two read port and one write port. How about dual issue, such as Pentium? Dual issue, two issue, super scalar pipeline. Okay, two instructions are going to the fetch stage, decode stage, read stage, execution stage, and write back stage. The same register file, how many ports do you need to allow? Do you should, we should have to have this five stage pipeline for two issue super scalar? I'm asking simple question. That's right. Four read port and two write port. Port. Clear and understood? Okay. How about memory? Let's say your memory. Memory might have. This is let's say two issue super scalar. So two instruction can be integer operation. Two instruction can be memory operation. Okay. And. Two instruction can be floating point instruction. So you, you can have option of integer ALU, memory, okay, cache pipeline, and also floating point unit. Okay, let me ask you first question. How many execution unit you will install for your processor for two issue? How many execution unit? How many integer ALU, how many floating point unit, and how many memory unit? I'm asking. If you are a designer, okay. So you come to Intel. I'm I, I'm your supervisor, okay. Okay, you have a good background from your undergraduate. You have a good GPA, okay. You can do the design. You have studied computer architecture, both in undergraduate and also in graduate school. Okay, you know the uh, backend execution unit. Okay, so you want to design two issues super scalar for next generation embedded processor core, which can be used for your maybe MP3 player or whatever, okay? And we want to design this five-stage pipeline. And how many, what kind of execution unit will you design for this processor? How many for each? Okay. How many? So one integer, one floating point, one memory, or what? How many? There are integer instructions, integer arithmetic. There are floating point instructions. There are memory load or store operation. Okay? So how many each execution unit will install for this processor? Two integer and one floating, one floating point unit and two memory. two memory. Why? Okay, so so when you design a processor, you have to think about so for floating point instruction, if it's embedded processor, if they don't do much floating point computation application, and then they usually skip floating point unit, so they don't have floating point instruction and they don't have floating point unit. That's usual for small embedded processors. Okay, maybe for high performance processors or high performance uh, float, uh, embedded processors, they do some floating point operation. So they install floating point instruction in the instruction set architecture. And then you need floating point unit because the assumption was they have floating point instructions. Okay, so it starts from one ALU, one floating point unit, one memory. You should have at least one to handle those instructions. Okay, then you have to look, look at instruction combination of your application. Okay, usually integer operation, arithmetic operations are most common, right? You have to look at the distribution of instruction, right? And then memory, and then floating point instruction is small. Okay, so maybe, as you said, instruction integer operations are uh, frequent, and integer ALU is small. Floating point is, is, is usually big. Right? So you allow two integer ALU, one floating point unit, and also one memory. Because memory is quite big, and memory is not as frequent as integer operation. For the memory, if it takes one cycle, and if you have two memory operations, then there is only one memory <coughs> cache. So 
due to structural hazard, one should be delayed, right? Okay? The, the other solution is you allow two ports to the cache so that you can access. Two access can be done in simultaneously to the single memory, execution unit, single memory cache, okay? Then you can issue two loads simultaneously to the single processor. So you use one <coughs> memory pipeline, one memory execution unit we need with two ports might be a solution. Okay? And port, you have to look at inside this uh, SRAM structure also. And let's have a break and we'll come back. Okay. <coughs> so multi port means you have to think about the memory cell. For SRAM cell, Single to store a uh, one bit SLS, how many transistors do you need? This transistor. So what's, what is the structure of this SLS? Two pass transistor. Right? You have studied CMOS BSR in your underwood report, right? Can you explain this operation? No? Okay. What is the function of this pass transistor? Uh, it's MS. <coughs> switch. Oh. What's the function of this switch? What is the gate? and Q bar, whatever. There is a loop, and one is reading Q. This might be a Q and Q bar. I'm not sure this. <coughs> so, word line, here there is a decoder. Decoder. So you have maybe uh, 8 bit address line, and it have 8 to to the power of A decoder. And then you have how many cells? 256 cells. Or not cells, maybe entries. You can select one entry. Right? One can make one cache line. And they will activate this pass transistor and you can read you can read the state. Okay? This that is a single port. Because you can read one read. If you have another decoder, okay, and another word line that goes into here, then you need another pass transistor. Right? <coughs> Anyhow, these are another bit line, word line. So if you have two word lines, then one word line will select one cell, one entry, the other word line will select another entry. So you can read two entry. Okay, that's two read code. Understood? Okay? And write require maybe another word line. I mean, line means you have to store instead of read. So there might be other circuit. Okay, that's the point. So for each port you need to add wired, and at least two transistors, okay? So that is the multiport, as I said. I did not, I have explained this before, right? <coughs> that is the port, port. Later five is the same. It's either, both of them are as <coughs> So if you allow multiple memory ports, 
you can have dual port or triple port at the same side, okay? Or you can have multiband. What is multiband? So for, for each multiband, do you need a multi-port cell or single port cell can be used? <coughs> multiband is simple. Okay, cache, you can have one dimensional that's array, right? two dimensional array. Instead of single array, you can divide this into four array. Four array. And it's called band. Okay? Instead of single two dimensional array, you have four array, four back. If it's two array, two back. Okay? And assuming four bank, four arrays, and then you can store all the memory tag that are end with address 0, 4, 8, 12, and so on, you store into back jam. The address tag end with address 1, 3, uh, 1, 5, 9, and so on, mode, mode 1, right? you store into back four. Bank two and bank three and so And then, if you have this four bank, if you recast to this memory system, if you generate four recast, if each recast is going to four different banks, then you can allow four different access simultaneously because it goes to four independent banks. Okay? And each bank only needs to have only one single port because they process only one recast. So even with single port, if you divide it multi band, then the cache can uh, process multiple memory requests every cycle. It's the same as multi port, but it is actually smaller and cheaper. Or cheaper because each cell is small. You don't need extra port, extra transistor. Because in terms of each bank, they are processing only one request at a time. Understood? That is the bank. I have explained this to you. Maybe about two or three times. You remember, right? But you didn't understand. You just pay nothing. Pay didn't any attention. You go back, you come back, you, you don't know okay? that. Whenever I am teaching you, it's useless. Okay? Your problem. If you don't understand clearly, you have to go back. You got the password, you got the repeat. Identify the issue. If you don't know, you can ask me, someone or other student. If they don't know, you can have to ask me, like him. Right? Each major is voice processing, right? signal processing. Mm -hmm. It's nothing to do with computer activity. But he's studying all this textbook exercise. How about you? Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay, let's. Think about this penalty. This penalty, <coughs> so we have reviewed, you can use non blocking cache, multi memory ports. You start cache and memory access in parallel, right? You send critical words as soon as it arrives, or you can use write buffer, and so on. <coughs> and the other is you can also employ multi level of cache to reduce this penalty, okay? Average memory access time is equal to heat time plus, okay, on a miss, you pay miss, miss rate times miss penalty. But this miss penalty, you don't have to pay extra miss, entire miss penalty if you have second level cash. So miss penalty equation can be replaced by another heat time of L2 cash plus miss rate of L2 cash times miss penalty. Okay? So, average of MLS time is heat time plus miss rate times miss penalty. If you have only a single level of cash, if you have two levels of cash, this miss penalty can be replaced by this another average memory of set time equation. It's recurrence relation. Okay? And if you have third level of cash, this miss penalty can be replaced by another heat time of L3 plus miss rate of L3. Time to miss production. Okay? And you can reduce it uh, effectively. Right? I don't have to go through this detail. This is basic. Right? Okay? 
<coughs> so if you have second level cash for if you have uh, these capacity miss and conflict message, many of these can be captured by second level cache. Because you have large caches, conflict misses, if you even if it's replaced, it will be still in the second level cache. And second level cache is much bigger, so you can capture uh, capacity misses as well. Okay? <coughs> but it doesn't have compulsory misses, because compulsory miss, even if you have infinite cache, it will always miss. It should go to memory, okay? because the first access to the memory. So usually, design issue, second level cache should be bigger, and block size should be bigger. And you have to also consider replacement algorithms. Right? Because their block size are different. If you employ some replacement algorithm, you need to, usually there is an inclusion property. The cache block is in L1, then it should also in L2, right? To provide this inclusion property. It's not easy. So you have to consider uh, replacement quality. Replacement <coughs> quality policy, they usually use LRU, list, list to be used, which is complex. Do you know what is LRU, right? Music, do you know what is LRU? What is LRU? <coughs> so LRU means Every cache block you have a timer. Timer? Timestamp. Okay? So whenever you access, you reset the timer. Okay? And every clock, you increment the timer. Okay? And which one is the block that is not referenced for the longest time? It should have the, type, the largest timer value. Right? Because Whenever you access, you reset the timer, and every clock you increment. So the block with the largest timer value are the block that stay the longest without reference. Okay? That block is going to be replaced by a That's the error. Okay? Okay, so what I'm trying to say is LRU is quite complex algorithm. So they usually do not implement LRU for the uh, cache. Instead of LRU, they do pseudo LRU. Okay? For large cache, you don't have to be exact. LRU is, LRU is the best scheme, but you can employ random replacement, which is as good as LRU for large cache. But there are so many entities, if you pick random, then you can reduce most of the missing. Okay? So they use random, but random is also quite difficult to implement. Think about random number generation. It's not easy to generate random number. So they use random, pseudo random algorithm for replacement policy, which means they try to randomly pick victim block for replacement. Okay, that's random. But random is quite difficult, so they pick pseudo randomly. So they usually employ hashing. Hashing means they look up from the physical address given. They select some bits and they do some exclusive work, hashing, and select the index, okay? So hashing function is trying to distribute this <coughs> index in, into uniform distribution across this number of entries. That's the hashing, you know, right? That's the pseudo random policy. But if you, could, you want to implement uh, inclusion property, which means whatever you miss, you can find it here. Or if you if you there, then you should it should be here. Right? That's into the property. Okay? The bigger cache, second level cache, always contain superset of this first level cache. So whenever you miss, so if you it's brought in here, then it should be here. And whenever it's evicted, it should be evicted from here. That's into the property. That's hard to make because. The pseudo random means the number of entries are different. So your hashing function should be the same, and you should guarantee the inclusion property, and the number of entries in the block, number of words in the block is different. So your hashing function is <coughs> not easy because one block maps to two blocks or one point half block. Yeah. Okay. So 
in textbook, they usually say inclusion property, they provide inclusion property because larger cash, larger blood, right? But in reality, in, in actual today, this inclusion property is not guaranteed because it's hard to do. Okay, I'm just talking about some implementation issue if you're a designer as, as a CQ designer want to build L1, L2, L3, and you know that from your textbook uh, study, uh, we have inclusion property so no. But the actual reality is that it's hard to provide inclusion property because of this kind of intrinsic complexity in the design. Okay? So design, the process of design is quite complex. I'm teaching you the basics. Uh, if you look at actual process and specification, that's quite complex design, very complex. So to understand application, instruction set architecture, logic circuit, and the layout. And also reliability issues. And they also involve some physical, physics issues also. Okay? The first, when I work on Itinium, I was reading uh, the design documents written by other architects, and there are, it's called microarchitecture specification, and there are a bunch of specifications <coughs> which is something like this, over to you. So the first day of my entry into Intel, which was April 1st, 1996, so they gave me a key and they give this old red document, which is Intel top confidential document, because it was not disclosed. And I was reading Intel ITM plus specification and their IC plus specification, which was this one. This is bit by bit specification. Okay, every sigma. Okay, it's about uh, more than 100 million register. And all those signals and specifications, and you didn't study in your textbook. You have to know that complexity. Okay? Okay, let's think about another buffer called store buffer. This is different from write buffer. So, this is a cache memory. Write buffer stage between cache and memory. You want to reduce this pattern, right? This penalty. You just write into the write buffer and just you're done. And write buffer to the remain. Store buffer is between pipeline and the cache. Here. Okay? Write buffer and this is store buffer. So, why do you need store buffer? Write is more complex than read operation. Okay? Write operation involves three steps, which means you have to read. So, you have two dimensional array, cache. You have to read the cache block, okay? And then you modify specific data inside this cache block, okay? Specific instructional data. Um, for, should be a data because this is your right. instruction that you don't need to modify. And then you update cache. So read, modify, and update. Three steps, okay? This actually takes more time than read. Operation. Okay? <clears throat> so if you do write in this manner, then maybe read takes one cycle, write might take two cycles. Then whenever write is going on, read might should be blocked because write is busy. Right? So you want to decompose this write into a simpler operation. Okay? One solution is if you have byte enabled bits. Well, let's say each cash block, each byte you have byte enable bit. Enable bit. Using the byte enable bit, what you can do is you determine key to miss after after that, whenever you don't have to read, modify, write, you enable, you mask some data that you want to modify, and you just update only those enabled bytes. Right? Then that can be performed by the tag check and then write, instead of read, modify, write. Because when you update, you only update stuff on a small portion of your cash block, not the entire block. One is you read entire block, modify that small portion, and it update the entire block. That's complex. Instead, if you have bind enabled, you select only those portions 
by buying labels, and then you update it directly. Right? That's simpler than three steps. It's two steps. Right? With store buffer, so actually you don't employ this kind of scheme. They use store buffer, which means with the store buffer, you determine hidden address. You just look up the tab, right? the max tab, and you determine hidden address. And the way you tell me hit or miss, <coughs> if on a hit, you store your index and weight, which bank, right? And data into a store buffer. So you just write into the cache, you just look up the tag, tag and determine hit or miss, okay? And compare the tag, and then you can determine this index and weight. Index is, you have decoded. Index is, you can get it from right away from the <coughs> Physical address, where it can be determined by tag compare. Tag compare matches in some band, and that's the way you have to look up. Okay? So you generate this index and weight, and instead of storing it to the cache, which takes too much time, you store it to the store. Then, write is about the same complexity as the read operation. Okay? You just access the tag array and you write it to the store. Okay, so write chart is fast as read. So write should not block the read. Okay? <coughs> and then this store buffer, whenever the cache is idle, as I said, cache is there are multiple requesters coming back from field, snoop, or, or read or write from the pipeline. But if there are no other requests, the store buffer can do the write from the store buffer to the cache, right? Independently using the memory either cycles. So this is called cycle stealing. Cycle stealing. You have heard of this cycle stealing before. And you finish cache update and cache it either. So you can reduce store hit time and you can reduce read store. Because write is as fast as read and write can be performed quite fast. And actual write into the cache can be performed by store form using the cycle, cycle steel. Understood? That is the store. Okay? So which is different from my book. Okay. okay. Ah, reducing hit time. So fill buffer. You need fill buffer because as I said, you are trying to do a road, but if fill is going on, you cannot access the cache. If the cache has only one port, one read port, right? One write port, one port. Because Feel is doing all right, the cache is busy. Sometimes, but feel, you can delay the feel because feel is not urgent, right? But read is urgent, somebody is waiting. So you want to give priority to a read operation than to a feel operation, right? Mm -hmm. Then you need a buffer, you need to buffer the feel block. The block coming from the memory, you should store it in the field. Right? If you store right away to the cache, it might block the read operation. That's why we need field buffer. So the field operation can be done using cycle speed. Whenever the cache is active, the field can go on. Right? <coughs> okay, and also they use for set associative cache, they also use weight prediction or heap prediction, even without accessing the tag, or even access compare, they can predict this time it will be a hit, this time the <coughs> cash block will be in this bank. Okay? It's like branch prediction. Okay? So they have this predictor also. And <coughs> it's, it, is first, it was first introduced in Bix I-10000, which was the Silicon Graphics workstation station and it was popular since then. <coughs> and today's processor such as ARM Cortex A Day, this was used for uh, Apple's iPhone right? inside A4, A4 chip. They use weight prediction there for their OA associated caches. And the prediction accuracy is usually over 90% for two A associated cache, four A associated over 80%. Using prediction, you can reduce the hit time. You don't have to check detail. 
So they can predict and they can study right away. If you mispredict, then they have cancer, and then you pay maybe one side back to a penalty or something like that. Understood? That's good way prediction. <coughs> do you know what is virtually indexed physically tagged cash? Minji, do you know what is this? I think I taught you during other video class, contracting class. Anybody has an idea? Virtually indexed physically tagged cash. Any idea? Okay, China. Let's try. <coughs> uh, uh, address of the request data. Indexing with the virtual address and with the virtual address go to TLB and after TLB can after translate it to physical address. Mm -hmm. Then using the tag compared to uh, virtual uh, in, uh, tag from cache with the virtual index. That's normal translation procedure, right? <coughs> it's just same as the normal cache. So you have, it's, you're dealing with cache, but in front of cache you have TLB, because you need to translate virtual address to physical address. The normal procedure is the processor generates virtual address, which might be program counter or data address at the execution stage. You go into the TLB, you generate physical address, right? You change virtual page number to physical page number, and offset should be the same because they use the same page size. Okay? So from the physical address, you offset the cache. From the physical address, you extract the index, you do the decoding, and then after you identify the set, you do compare, right? Tag compare, and then you determine hit on it. This is normal procedure, right? If this normal cache is virtually indexed physically tag cache, China, or is it different? I mean, translation and tag reaching is simultaneous. How? <coughs> Remember sort of, but you don't know it exactly. Okay, so most first level cache are implemented as is virtually indexed physically tagged cache. Okay, the assumption is if you do the TLB translation, if you access cache, TLB access takes one cycle, cache access one cycle, then the first level cache access always takes at least two cycles. Okay, that's too long. Okay, so they want to reduce this delay. Can you access TLB and cache in parallel? That's the idea behind this virtually index physically type cache. Okay, so in general, you have this 32 bit virtual address, let's say pre size is 16 kilobyte. Okay, then how many uh, page offset bits do you need for 50, let's say 64 kilobyte page? This is 32 bit virtual address. You can decompose this into virtual page number and page offset. And the assumption was page size is 64 kilobyte. How many bits for this page offset? Means it. So this is power of 2 to the 16 bytes. Right? So you need 16 bits here and 16 bits here. Okay? Understood? Okay. 
So you access TLB. TLB. TLB contains VPN as tag. These are the tag. And the actual data is physical case number. Right? So they access if the same virtual page number they translate using the physical page number. And if they use the same 32 physical address, this should be also 16 bits. And then the page offset here and physical page number here. From here, you get tag index and offset. Okay, which we have studied. Okay, if the cache is, let's say, 32 kilobyte cache, <coughs> Minji, assume that cache is 32 kilobyte cache and the block size is 32 bytes. How many bits for the offset? Okay, this is physical address. You have tag, index, and offset. How many bits for offset? <coughs> so offset is trying to on a cache for 32 kilobyte cache with 32 by blocks. How many blocks in the cache? Kuya, how many blocks? 32 kilobyte cache, 32 by blocks. How many blocks? What? Two to the power of 10, which is how many? A number, exact number. Okay, 1024 blocks. And each one is 32 bytes, right? 32 bytes. Okay, 4 bytes. So there are, each one you have 4 bytes. Ah, 32 bytes. So it's not 4 bytes, 32 bytes. Okay. 32 bytes. Okay. So offset is means pay attention. Nothing to write at this moment. You can read either instruction or data, right? Instruction for 32 bit processor, usually 32 bit instruction. So you are reading four bytes from the memory. For data, it can be one byte, two byte, four byte, or eight byte, depending on how many bytes you are loading, right? So for this, there are load byte, load half word, load word, load double word instruction. Okay? So you can transmit from one byte to eight byte, depending on the data size. But if it's instruction, you are sending four byte instruction. Okay? There are 32 byte data in the cache block. Okay? So the offset is the byte address. Right? This physical address is byte address, which tells you the first by beginning by of your data or instruction. Okay? Which one is the first byte you, you have need to transmit? And then starting from the address, if it's four byte data or instruction, you are sending four byte. So it's starting from one thousand, you are sending one thousand address one thousand, one thousand one, one thousand two, one thousand three, four byte. Okay? This address determines the first byte. Okay, there are 32 bytes in the block. So there are 32 possibilities. Okay? You, you don't know which one. It tells you, you have to look up this. So there are 32 bytes. How many bits do you need to look up? 5 bits, RSP. It tells you which exact byte you need to start to look up. Okay? That is the block offset. Which byte in the block? Okay? So, you need five bits. so offset should be five bits, right? Because there are 32 bytes. And let's say this is direct mapped cache, which means there is only one 
block, cash block. You need to look up. Go to that much. Cash, every member will block every one location you can go to. Fully associated cash, 1024 location. Okay? 2875 cash, only two locations. Are you see? So, for direct bank cash, how many competitors do you need? Mm. One unit, only one, because you need to look up only one. And how do you identify? You have to look at this is one out of 1024. So, how many index bits do you need? Means 10 bits. Okay? So, using the 10 bit, you do the decoding. Okay? You select one, and you fetch, and using the offset, you identify the first byte, and extract maybe four bytes, right? And send it to the pipe track. Tag is the same. Same entry, same tag, you have to match the tag, right? Okay? That's the tag index and offset. Okay. <coughs> That is the tag index and offset. So, here the idea is, let's say this is, after the, the, you do the translation, you grab the index, you do the decoding, you compare the tag, and then grab the cache block using the offset, you extract the byte and send it to the Python. Right? This is cache offset. But, should you wait until this translation is done? You, you should you access TLB and cache sequentially? Means, okay, for this organization, should you access TLB and cache sequentially, or can you access TLB and cache in parallel? Think. You need to think. Can you do it parallel and what? Yes or no, and why? One of you answer. If you look at the page, this page offset, this bit, this 16 bit, is same in virtual address and physical address, right? You only change this virtual page number, which is higher the bit. So these are, these are the same. These are the same. So you can use, this should be the same in the physical address. But if you look at this index and offset, these are 15 bits. Index and offset can be extracted from the virtual address directly. Right? Understand? Then, what do you mean is, you can access TLB and you can extract the index and you can access the cache index decoding at the same time. Okay? So you can access TLB and cache access in parallel. After index decoding, and then you get the tag, and they get the physical page number they compare. Okay? And then they can determine it order. So at least you can eliminate index decoding time from this critical path of TLB and cache access because they can be accessed in parallel. So essentially, this index usually should come from the physical address, but you can get it from the virtual address. Because if the cache size is small enough, this index and offset determine the cache size. Right? It's smaller than virtual page size, then you can get the index from the TLB. Okay? Let's say, so, if the page size is, let's say, Instead of 16 bytes, if it's 14 bytes, okay? Then, this 32 kilobyte cache, 10, 15 bit. You cannot get the index from the virtual address, right? With this cache organization, okay? Is there any solution? Can you overcome this limitation? Any idea? I'll give you five bonus points. Change cache design to That's right. If you make it with 32 kilobyte cache as a two-way set of sheet with cache, then the index becomes only nine bit. Because there are instead of 1024 blocks, you have 500 sets. 
and each set is two bit, two blocks. So you need nine bit, and nine bit plus or five bit can be extracted from the bottom of them. Okay? Understood? No? Can you understand? Kuyan, can you understand? Because set associative cash you divide in the bank side, bank has only 512 blocks, right? Instead of 1024. So index you need only 9 bit instead of 10 bit. So 9 bit plus 5 bit offset can be extracted from 15 bit page offset, 14 bit page offset. So by making it set associative, you can actually design into, into this virtual index which we can catch. Think about it. Okay? I get jobs. Since we spent too much time, I'll stop here. So this is the coverage you need to study for your midterm exam, which you offer uh, next week. Okay? The midterm coverage, I think my plan is about half of the question will come from your textbook exercise, including homework. Okay? So we have homework in, at the end of this slide. We should solve all the uh, textbook exercise for so chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, or chapter 4. I don't know the exact number. Let me have the textbook. Who has the textbook? So, so far we have studied chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. Chapter 3. So 1 to 3, you need to study chapter 1 to 3 in order to exercise. Okay? Half of the question will be covered from the textbook exercise, and half of the question will be custom made by myself. Okay? So, I'm going to see you in two weeks.